sitting in VIP with a guy I barely know. He kept trying like a Leah, so I told him I would go. His pockets were small, but his chain weighed a ton. I called them Biggie Smalls, but no big pun. And then I saw these girls, they were pointing from the bar. I must have seen me pull up in my red Ferrari. I'm like, girl, don't push me because you missed the mark. Only thing that I push is my push to start. And then I took a shot, a shot of vodka. And then I took a puff, I'm not a Rasta. What I look like, girl, I'm not her. She rolled her eyes, then I walked up like, do, 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 do. La, 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 yes, I'm talking to you. If you keep on talking shit, I'ma pull out my... Hello, good evening. My name is Claudia Tesserin Campbell, and I am the president and chairperson of the Daughters of Sheba Foundation. I'm just checking here. If you are hearing me, let me just check. Uh, da, 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 let's see. Hearing me. Okay, yes, you are. So I have a very special guest this evening. It's Saturday. It's a Saturday evening. And once per month, we do what's called long bench chat, where I have a conversation with a woman of interest, a woman who has been through stuff and um, used that stuff to, to, to make it her life's purpose. And this evening, my special guest is Erin Faith Kaba. She, you will find out more about her. But before I bring her on, I want to share with you um, a clip uh, that explains some, some parts of what Erin um, does. So if you're just coming in, please take a moment. Good evening, Christine. How are you? Please take a moment and share and share this live because this is a very interesting conversation. It's she might even open for you a career path that you never thought about. So uh, let's get into this. Let me um, share this. Give me a moment. That the over medicalization of dying in many countries is extreme and harmful. And this is where the death doula comes into the frame. And it's a term that you may or may not have heard of. So what exactly is a death doula? What are the pros and cons of hiring one and taking it up as a profession? Please like and subscribe if you learn something new. Now let's talk death doulas. What is a death doula? To quote the Australian Doulas College, an end of life doula is a non-medical role that provides support, options and education assisting the dying and those around them to have the end of life unfold in alignment with their wishes, to preserve their quality of life, well-being and self-worth up to and beyond the end of life as we know it. They are the informed companion, bringing comfort, support, compassion and assist a person and their family in feeling safe and supported during this important transition. As stated, they are not medical or mental health professionals. They fill the void that would naturally be filled by a particular wise and trusted community member in other less death avoidant cultures. So let's get some practical examples of what a death doula could do if you were to hire one. Provide the opportunity to talk openly and honestly about the dying process. Alleviate the anxiety, guilt and shame often associated with death and dying. Develop a plan for how a person's environment should look, feel, sound and smell for them. Coordinate with family and friends to evaluate visitation, and we'll come back to this. Overseeing 24-7 care alongside healthcare providers like hospice and palliative care. We'll also come back to this later. Providing education about things like do not resuscitate orders and healthcare power of attorneys, creating guided meditations and rituals specific to that person's religious faith or spirituality, sitting with the person in their final moments, assisting with the writing of obituaries and planning the funeral, providing companionship after someone has died, finding creative ways to honour the person after they have died, which can include the person who is dying as part of the process and exploring that person's life and legacy. So, as a doula, you must be empathetic, obviously, have a great knowledge around death and dying from a legal, medical, religious, cultural and psychological perspective to the point that you can break it down to a very basic level. You need to be flexible with your belief and your time. People don't die at convenient times and they often follow religions that you don't. Okay, so for those of, those of us who wondered what the heck is, I, I was saying to Erin um, before we came on, good evening, um, 
Cleo, how are you? I was saying to Erin before we came on that um, I know what a doula is, you know, and as the lady just said in the clip, a doula is is someone who who companions. No, I know what a doula is in the context of um, birth, giving birth, pregnancy, pregnant mother. I I I, I even when I was younger and ha and had my child, I I thought of um, having a, a death, not a death, a doula. But I never heard of a death doula. And so this is part of the reason why I'm looking forward to this conversation with Erin. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? I am wonderful. I'm wonderful. I'm a little bit tired, but I'm wonderful. <laughs> so there is much more to you than just this part that I've, 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 I've chosen to highlight. Reason, because it's a salacious part. <laughs> it's, it's a part that most of us... Um, probably don't, don't fully understand. But let mm. me just tell people a little bit. Erin is the author of a book entitled Destroy the Mask, and we will talk about that some, uh, some this evening. She's also a success strategist and a rebirth to death doula. Erin yes. is located near to Washington, D.C. in the United States. So before we go into all of what she does, I just want to find out a little bit more about Erin. Erin, there is this thing that I do where I ask people to, to share with me three words that describes who they are. So I know success strategy, so don't tell me that. I know rebirth to death doula, don't tell me that. And I know author. And obviously, I think, well, at least you're female. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's drama nowadays about who is a woman from who is not a woman. So let me just say you're female. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me three words that describes Erin Faith Kaba. Is it Kaba? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, three words that describe me. Um, coffee lover. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I am a lover of all things beautiful, like beauty. Um. And I'm curious. Curious. Mm -hmm. Well, you must be curious to do the work that you do. You know, that that blend of things that you do, that only a curious person can, could do that. And yes. what's your favorite food on a Sunday afternoon? On a Sunday afternoon? Um, probably like sushi. I like sushi a lot. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I have not acquired a taste for sushi. <laughs> It's not for okay. everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's not for everyone. Um, so having broken the ice, let's talk about your your decision. What brought you to what you do now? As an author, a success strategist, and mm -hmm. a birth to death doula. What <laughs> what prepared you for all of these three paths? Well, um, so my background is in education. So I, um, my bachelor's and, master's and master's degree is in education. So I was in the classroom for about 13 years. I still work in the education sector, but more corporate. However, a few years ago, I went through a rebirth myself. <laughs> and um, I kind of like leaned into who I was instead of who I was told to be. And so through that rebirth, I tapped into a curiosity that I had always had like growing up with death. And I wasn't like necessarily scared of death, but something about it always left me with questions and it always led me down like a rabbit hole of like Googling things. And then when I was little, I would like use the dictionary to look up stuff. Um, but I had seen a death doula. I had never heard of a death doula before mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago. And I had seen one online and I, it just kind of was like intriguing to mm -hmm. me. Um, and as you know, in, during COVID, we saw a lot of people lose their life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I myself lost about six or seven people that were close to me. And it wasn't even due to COVID. It was just other things during that time of COVID. Mm -hmm. And one thing that ran, rang true 
especially in the African American community, is that number one, a lot of us don't prepare for the inevitable, right? Like 100% of us who are born today are going to die. Like we can't- 101. <laughs> yes, we can't argue with those statistics. So I find that a lot of us are not prepared. And then I found that a lot of us are all, at the time of death, if somebody dies that is close to us, we always say, I should have done this. If I had more time with them, I would have done this. And even um, during COVID, our mortality, we had to question our own mortality. And it's like, okay, if this was the last moment on earth, did I really live a life that I really wanted to live? So um, when I found out what a death doula was, I wanted to become a death doula to kind of help our community leave a legacy and basically prepare for the end of life. I just want to cut you one second because there's a question here, which I think, I'm not sure why it's being asked, and but I think it's important that we answer. So Adon Aki Joel, welcome. Thank you for joining us, as well as to Christine and Cleo um, Carl for join, joining us. So Adon Aki Joel is asking, are you guys coaches? I am. Um, let's see what, what, um, yes. success, what Erin says. I'll let her answer for herself. So, yes, I have a coaching um, business. It's called the Oya Collective. So in my practice, um, like the title is I'm a rebirth to death doula. So I, I help women have a transformative rebirth, live with audacity and help them leave a legacy. So I do have a coaching um, business. Yes. Okay, sorry, I, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you, you said that during COVID, you recognized um, that us, particularly as a Black community, um, we do not prepare for the inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 and, and we see it all the time. You know, even recently, there was um, the release of the Bob Marley, and I'm using it just because it's popular. Um, the release of the Bob Marley uh, movie, One Love. And one of the things that was eye-opening for some people or, you know, younger people who didn't know that he didn't leave a will. He 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 didn't prepare, you know. And um, I remember there was an interview by, by one of his children, I think it's Rohan, um, who's, and he said that he was explaining the, the drama, the trauma, and all the family went through after Bob's death with, there was no preparation, yeah. you know. So I can imagine that it was rampant in the States in particular where so many people died mm -hmm. um, during COVID that it became a thing that, hey, guys, you need to think. Why do you feel in your experience, I don't want to focus all evening that the time that we have on the, the death aspect, but why do you think that people don't? Do, do they think that they're going to live forever? I think they're scared to talk about it. A lot of times people think that if they talk about something, it will trigger it to happen, like it'll cause it to happen. So they don't want to talk about grandma dying because it might like speed up her death process. I don't know. But like, I think people are scared. Um, people don't really understand what happens when someone passes away until they're faced with it. What happens when someone passes away? <laughs> so a lot. Um, so if someone has never experienced death, um, a death of someone close to them, like a lot of people don't know what to do, like right after the person dies, like, okay, do I call the funeral home? Like, what do I do with the body? What do I, if somebody gets a diagnosis, they don't know that certain things can be in place before the person dies, you know? So it's just a lot happens and it depends on, um, I guess, where they are in their wealth of knowledge. Um and I could talk about what happens physically <laughs> um, when people die or like financially, there's financial things that happen. There's physical things that happen. There's things that you have to do after a person dies to wrap things up. So yeah, there's a okay. lot. <laughs> so um, 
explain for me how does explain for me the rebirth to death particularly the rebirth what are we talking about here is this like being born again in the christian so, context no well it could it could look like that so a lot of us don't think about our lives until we don't have much life left. <laughs> and um, so rebirth is, especially as women, we are taught or conditioned to be a certain way and to do certain things. And I firmly believe that we are created for um, a specific purpose, but sometimes our conditioning leads us away from what we were actually created to do. Um, so the rebirth is getting rid of dismantling, deconstructing, getting rid of that societal, cultural, religious conditioning, whatever conditioning it may be, and actually sitting with yourself and say, okay, am I showing up as my authentic self? I'm not just the mother. I'm not just the wife, but who am I? And am I living according to what's in alignment for my life? What's in alignment with my goals and values? And so I'll give you an example of my rebirth. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up, grew up in a very cult-like religion mm -hmm. and I'm not here to bash religion at all, but there is a dark side to certain religions, right? There's um, so I grew up in a cult like um what was the name of it? So if you don't mind my was a denomination of Pentecostal. Okay. Um, and so I was taught to believe certain things about the world and about certain people. And finally, when I got to college, um, because I had never gone to public school or anything, I went to their like Christian school, um, mm -hmm. kindergarten to 12th grade. And I really only had access to the people in that like denomination. And so when I went out, went to college, what I was taught about the world and to think about people was not correct. <laughs> and I was told that, you know, I have to work for the kingdom and I have to do certain things with my life in order to be accepted. Right. And so I'm like, I have these different desires, but. I mean, I'm told that they're sinful, like even just down to like wearing makeup, wearing pants and like down to that, um, to not working in the church. I want to work, you know, in a public facing, you know, environment. So just things like that. And I'd always have questions, but I was always taught, don't question anything. Basically don't question God, don't question our teachings. And finally I realized that those desires and those things that I would just like dream about, those were connected to my purpose, but I was pushing them down because it didn't align with what I was taught to believe. So like a lot of us are like that as women, a lot of us are on this path that we're told to be on and to have a rebirth, it's to break all that stuff down, take inventory and start showing up and living life according to who you truly are. So that's the rebirth aspect. Okay, okay. You know, uh, you might have seen me smile. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how I contained myself and didn't burst out laughing when you said words like kingdom mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, <laughs> and, and cult because um, a lot of people do not, sorry, I'm going off on a little tangent here. Um, a lot of people don't believe that in our African-based, African heritage that we have cults, you know, when we think of cult, um, we think of, I'm sorry, white people, you know, crazy white people in the back, some back bush in, 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 in Waco, you know, <laughs> and um, the only, only cult that we ever think about and talk about in, in within our context is the one Jim Jones in Guyana. And that was a white man, you know? So I found it interesting that you brought that up, you know? Well, I will say, yeah, the, de the denomination that I was in was predominantly white. Okay. Okay. However, I know black people who were grown and raised like me. So like, it's also in the African community as well. 
yeah, yeah. What? Sorry, we're we're going down a little rabbit hole here a little bit. It's okay. What? What leads a person aside from growing up, you know, as a child, um, mm -hmm. but an adult to become enraptured and, and, and entrapped by cults in your mind? The desire for community, the desire for um, hope. You know, a lot of these religious places make a lot of promises. If you do this, then you will get this. If you follow our teachings step by step, then you will get this. Um, and like, when I say community, the what, what I was in, it wasn't all bad. Like I had friends, you had people that were nice, but then it's just like certain things underneath that were harmful. Um, so I think a lot of it is community and um, a lot of us, no matter what religion we were, yes, the need to, to belong. Hi, Colleen. Thanks for joining. A lot and of Gabriel <laughs> from Nigeria <laughs> at 11, 13 p.m. <laughs> a lot of us are always taught that we're born in sin, like we're born bad. Mm -hmm. And so we think that we have to do something to make ourselves clean or make ourselves worthy. And so I think a lot of people, they get, they get wrapped up in, you know, that wanting to feel worthy. So your rebirth process um, will take a person. Okay. So you come across, cause I, I had a friend years ago, a white lady who mm -hmm. grew up in a cult and here, here in Alberta, rural Alberta, and um, she ended up having multiple personalities because mm -hmm. of the experience that she went through, child abuse, la, 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 la. But without, let's not use somebody so drastic, but somebody who is, and you have cults here on social media. Um, they're not necessarily religious. You know, as Colleen said, the need to belong. You have people joining cliques for the want of a, a better word, for the same reasons, you know, and, and getting involved in online bashing and, and all of that. So somebody comes to you and says, I'm at a place in my life that I'm not happy. You know, I, 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 I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like who I've become. And so walk us through what your process with such a person would be. First, I would congratulate them for even acknowledging that they're not happy because a lot of us ignore that. Um, and what I would do is I would ask them to kind of take inventory. What exactly put a, put a name to it. Why aren't, why don't you think you're happy? What's missing? What do you want to change in your life? So it, first we would take inventory and acknowledge what it is that's making you unhappy or causing discomfort. Um, then I would have, I, I literally, so when I did this myself, um, when I was questioning like my faith, I wrote down three, like three columns, what I believed, what, no, what I was taught to believe, what I actually believed and what didn't like resonate or what I didn't believe. And so that could be for, that could be done for whomever. So you just kind of like write down, what is it? that I'm feeling? What is it that I feel like I need? Um, or what is it that I have questions about that I don't have answers to? So the first step is definitely taking inventory. Um, and then you kind of like lean into what you want to do. So for example, someone's unhappy, they want to make a certain change in their life, a career change, or um, they don't want to live a certain way. What is it that you want to do? Lean into that. Like a lot of us push down our desires and our wants because it might not fit with the blueprint that we're given. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a mother, but I want to do X, Y, and Z, but I can't because I'm a mother. No, you can do certain things. They, people think that we can't do things because we have these titles. So it's lean into what it is that you want. And then you just kind of like take the steps to do like, what do you need to do? to get where you want to go. Yeah. So um, uh, how would you describe your practice? Is it medium, small, growing? What, what's, what's? 
Uh, right now, it, it's small. It's small. Um, I work one on one with women. Um, I do want to build a group, like coaching um, membership community or something like that, to kind of have community for women who are on the path of destroying their their mask, like my book, <laughs> and um, just kind of give community and encouragement to to women who want to go ahead and live in alignment with who they truly are and have support along the way. Okay. So you mentioned the book mm -hmm. and destroying the mask. So let's, let's, let's bring that up. Um, yes. So the title of your book, as you can see on the screen, folks, is Destroy the Mask, A Woman's Guide to Unlock Her True Self, Live Out Her Purpose, and Leave a Legacy of Power. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you first, why women? Why are you focused on women? Why not people? Um, it's funny you ask that. I actually, I went into this writing it for, for women just because I start out talking about my experience as a woman and I didn't want, I didn't like, I can't talk about the male journey um, <laughs> and certain things that they go through. I, I felt like I could talk better to women. However, I have had a few men read my book mm -hmm. and they, you know, have said, you know, they've shared certain things that have helped them and that they too go through certain things that are similar to what I went through in my book. But I just feel like, I I can speak women. <laughs> yeah, women. Okay. yeah. Okay. All right. So 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 in your experience, um, what are some of the common masks that people mm -hmm. or women wear? That that I mean, apart from the motherhood thing, um, mm -hmm. hiding behind the fact that, or I shouldn't say hiding, but the mask of motherhood. Aside from that, what are some of the common masks that women um, put on? Common masks. So a lot of the masks that we wear could be cultural conditioning. So we're brought up to be X, Y, and Z. Like I've had some students who their parents basically told them, you, you're either going to be a doctor or a lawyer, but they want to be an artist. Art doesn't fly in some households, right? You're either going to be doctor, or lawyer, or something of like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I see people getting degrees, but it's not necessarily their passion. So they're showing up in life as a doctor, but they really want to be an architect or something like that. So that's a mask. Um, another mask could be hiding the fact that you have depression, putting a smile yeah. on your face, and, yeah. and, um, hiding the fact- I that wore that mask for a long time. Yes. Hiding the fact that you have anxiety because anxiety and mental- illness or mental health issues in some communities, you're not even allowed to admit that you have that. Or if you do admit that you have that, you either are met with, oh, you need to pray more, or you have a demon, or you're, you're just, they gaslight you. So you're wearing the mask, trying to smile, but on the inside, you're dying. You're dying. Yes. Um, another mask could be um, identity. Like, you know, you see a lot of people out here with identity issues and they're told to look a certain way, but they might not want to look like that. They're told to be a certain gender. And they might not feel that way. Um, that's a more extreme mask. Um, another mask could be just going with the flow of, oh, I should buy this house. I should get this car. I should get this degree because that's the American thing to do. I'm just going to live the American dream. But you really want to go travel and live in an RV and go from state to state to state. But you're just showing up in life trying to look like this prototype of somebody and you really want to do something else. So it's just masks can be different things. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, how for me, it took it took me uh, a relationship breakdown, a, a long term relationship breakdown. Um, driven, dr no, I drove myself to the point twice of, of attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. It took it took all of that for me to realize. Oh yeah, I'm wearing a mask. But without all of that drama, how can a person realize that they are in fact in a mask? acknowledge it, um, put words to it, t label it, 
um, sit still and, and um, yeah, a- acknowledge it, like sit in it. Yeah. What does sit in it looks like? Mm. Feel your feelings. So for example, when I realized I was wearing, wearing a mask, so it starts out with like these little, I don't want to say little voices, but these little things like, oh, you know what? That doesn't really feel right. Um, I'm told to do this or, you know, I'm told that this path is right for me, but it doesn't really like feel right for me. Mm -hmm. And I had to kind of like sit and be like, you know, I'm going to figure out what this is. So like during my rebirth, when I realized I was wearing a mask, um, it was actually a couple of years ago, a couple of years before the, the pandemic. Um, I would go to church every Sunday and I would sit on the in the pew and I'd get, you know, encouragement, but certain things that were being taught and certain like um things that I was being told about what I should be and what I should be doing. It just didn't sit right with me, but I would go every single Sunday because that's what I was supposed to do. But on the inside, I wasn't really there. Mentally, I wasn't really there. I was just going through the motions. And then finally, during the pandemic, um, it's actually George Floyd (laughs) Mm. prompted me to destroy my mask. Okay. Um, I was watching church online because at the time, that's what we were doing. Mm-hmm. And I was still going to a church where my pastor um, was was white, uh, but a lot of his um, congregants were African American. And the Sunday after George Floyd, instead of spreading hope, instead of you know spreading a positive message, he had chosen to make the message like more political. Mm-hmm. And like a lot of things had been brewing up until that point. But then finally I was like, why do I continue to put myself in this situation where I'm, I'm, I'm sitting under a spiritual leader that I don't necessarily agree with or can't read the room basically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I was like, you know what? For years I've just been going to church because I felt like this church, because I felt like, I had to, there was no other way. Cause I was taught that you have to be this denomination or you're going to go to hell. You have to, even if you're Baptist, you're going to go to hell. You have to be this type of Pentecostal or you're going to go to hell. So I was, you have to follow Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus only. You have to be baptized in Jesus name. If you're baptized in father, son, Holy ghost, you're going to go to hell. Like that's what I was going through. So I'm like, and so there's, they also said like, you know, if you like learn about other religions, if you learn about other things, you're going to go to hell because you're questioning, questioning God. So I just sat there and I'm like, I cannot sit under a spiritual leader who just cannot read the room, who can't like spread hope. And I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to lean in to what I feel. I'm going to write down the things I was told to believe what I don't believe, what I still believe, and I'm going to learn from myself. So that was the beginning of destroying my mask. And then when I did that inner work, I realized I had feelings of um, like self-worth, like identity issues or like with my blackness. And I was a thick, you know, I'm thick black woman. And there are a lot of people around me when I was growing up were white and skinny. So I had issues with that. Um, where where on you is thick? I don't see thickness anyway. <laughs> it's in the hips. It's in the hips. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it's definitely a journey destroying your mask. And it's it, I think for me, it's gonna be a lifetime of doing it of is. showing up as my authentic self because I had to be a certain way my whole life. And now it's just like it's a great feeling. But it's also, you know, sometimes you feel like a ship lost at sea. So you definitely have to stay anchored. Um, but yeah, I go through that. I go through my, that process in my book. So, <laughs> and I, yeah. Just for those who um, 
might we don't normally do this and uh it's so it, it might feel strange to you but i'm just going to put up a phone number here it's running at the bottom of the screen um if you have whatsapp you could give us a call on that before we end this conversation and ask um erin any question that you might have so the telephone number is 587-990-9823 whatsapp only so um i will try to make it work <laughs> this is be the second time I've ever done that. And as it says, please, no solicitations, no proposal of marriage to Erin. That's not what we're here for. Um, <laughs> we're here having a conversation how to, to take away, um, remove your masks and how to re, reborn, rebirth without um, the born again, without the, the, the religious component to it. So I'm so I'm reading here, um, Erin, it says that destroy the mask will teach you how to deconstruct, dismantle the things that do not serve you. You spoke about that. Mm -hmm. Embark on a journey of self-discovery so you can reclaim your identity. You, you spoke about that. Cultivate the audacity to transform your dreams into tangible realities. Let's stop there for a moment because at the Dr. Sashiba Foundation, every year we, we have a theme. Mm -hmm. And the theme this year is I am woman, um, innovative and resilient. And then mm -hmm. each month we break that down into a sub theme so that we can um, explain more what we mean. And this month, um, Colleen, who, who is watching us, he was the one who came up with the sub theme for this month. And that is Dare to Dream. Mm -hmm. So it struck me when I saw um, destroying the mask has the potential to to help you to transform your dreams into tangible realities. Mm -hmm. Can you can you give us some practical, a couple of practical steps of how that works? Because we we had another guest earlier this week, you know, and we use Christine, who is also now watching, um, to talk about how to do that, how to step into your dream, how to dare to dream, you know. And mm -hmm. you are now saying to us as well that the first thing that you need to do is to want to do it. Is to is to want to take off the mask is you know and um one of the masks people might not agree with this but one of the masks that a lot of us myself included wear is that of poverty is a mask of poverty would you not agree I we agree. We, t we tell ourselves that we're not children of an abundant god you know and um so we have to wait for handouts from politicians or from the neighborhood Don or from, from the neighborhood gang leader, you know? So we wear this mask, we walk around this poor me mentality. How, Erin, can any person, man or woman, remove that mask from themselves and Ooh. dare to dream? That is a hard mask to remove, but it can be. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> I know. I, every day, every morning, I wake up and say, get the fuck. Yeah. <laughs> morning. <laughs> um, first, you have to have do some mindset work because you are what you think, right? And so if you believe you can't, you won't. Uh, so first you have to, you know, I can have this. I can do this. So with for me... Um, I had that same mentality. I was living in, I grew up in Delaware, mm -hmm. so I was living in Delaware and a lot of people in Delaware, you know, in any small town, a lot of people don't leave. They just kind of stay. And I wanted to leave. I wanted to go somewhere, but I felt like I couldn't because I didn't have enough money and I didn't have the opportunity. I felt like I never get the opportunity and so all of a sudden, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of dreaming. I'm tired of looking at everybody else do the thing. I'm going to do the thing. So what you do is you just, whatever you it is you want, you take intentional steps towards that. And um, that's exactly what I did. I took intentional steps towards doing what I want. And I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to leave my, my town and I wrote down what, exactly what I wanted. I wanted to find love. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I was a single mom for about 10 years. Um, I wanted to find love. 
I wanted to move into a place that had a nice art scene. Like be specific about what you want. Don't say, oh, I just want a house or I just want to like move to a random place. Be specific. I said I wanted to move to a place with a good art scene. Um, and I wanted a house with a nice backyard. <laughs> And I started acting like I was, I didn't know where I was going, but I started put making the intentional actions to move myself towards that. I started cleaning my house. I started fixing my credit. You know, it's like stuff like that. You want to buy a house, but you have you credit. buy a house. You know what I'm saying? Like with your, if your credit, you have, I started saving money. I started getting rid of things that I didn't need. Cause I said, I'm going to move. I didn't know where I was going, but I said, I'm going to move. I started applying to jobs. And finally, I got a job offer in the D.C. area, good art scene. And so I was like, OK, yes, I found love. My husband lived in near D.C. And I was like, OK. And so then um, I have I was like, by the time I got my job, the stuff that I wasn't using in my house was already in boxes. I didn't know where I was going. But I knew I was going somewhere, right? And so it's taking those actionable steps. And another thing, and so I moved to Maryland. Um, and I like six months later, I got my house with the backyard. <laughs> so like, you have to be specific. And so one thing I do want to share, and I know some of your listeners will appreciate it. Again, I told you I grew up in a very white environment. And so I loved my blackness. I loved and I wanted to be, I wanted to go to Africa. I would study about Africa, but I was always made to feel like, oh, why are you doing that? And, you know, and so I wanted to embrace my blackness. So on my list, I wanted to just go to Africa. I didn't know where I wanted to go, but I wanted to go. So in order to do that, like I leaned into like my desire and my husband is actually from Sierra Leone and he was born and raised in Sierra Leone. And um, I was like, OK, but that wasn't necessarily enough for me. I needed to have like that African experience. So I took the African ancestry test and I tested my maternal lineage. And guess where it tested like my maternal lineage started in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my goodness. So at the time I had joined this group. So my maternal lineage is from the Temne tribe. And I joined this Temne group and they were like, hey, African ancestry, for those of you, us that test it to Sierra Leone, either Mende or Temne, twice a year, the president of Sierra Leone gives citizenship to those who want want it. And I was like, can I? And so before I'd be like, oh, I can never do that. I can never do that. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. So I went and I went through the process and I got, I stepped foot in Sierra Leone in Freetown and I am now a citizen, a dual citizen oh, wow. of Sierra Leone. And so just my desire to go to Africa, just leaning and taking the steps, it opened me up to a whole new world. And now not only did I go, I am helping a school there along with my group in um, like, you know, helping improve the school and like for my book sales, it would, it helped paint the school in our tribal town. And I just got back from Ivory Coast because I'm like, I have to, I just want to take the whole continent over. So <laughs> I was in Ivory Coast a couple of um, months ago for my birthday. And I was able to help a foundation there that helped women with domestic violence. But it all took me to just lean into that desire of just wanting to go to Africa. And now I've set up roots there. So I love that. I, you know, and I do not believe in coincidence. Um, synchronicity is, is, is real mm -hmm. because um, the, for the last two months, this is what we have been on about setting your intentions, setting mm -hmm. your intentions. You know, every year I say to people, don't bother with this nonsense about goal, New Year's resolution and all of that. Mm -hmm. Set your intention, create vision boards. It's something I've done. 
yes. for the last 15 years, create vision boards. And um, we had a conversation similar to this one. I don't think it was on a Saturday afternoon where I spoke with a lady by the name of Elaine Styling. And this is all she's about, setting intention. And actually next week, Tuesday evening, she's having a private session with some of us at the members of the Daughters of Sheba Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, we, will we will share it, but it's all about setting your intention. So I just, I mean, now here you are again saying the same thing, you know, and we had a discussion with somebody else this week and she said the same thing, you know, and you have people who think, it's it's hocus pocus you know i remember when i first came along this part and this teaching you know the minister it yes it was a a, a faith-based church place but she said to us you know some of you sit here and you wonder about the drug dealer or the the con artist and say oh they have all of this money you know you have to be bad or so and she said to us listen the universe doesn't care whether you are bad or good or whatever other labels we want to put it, the universe only cares about the intention that you're setting. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 maybe some, she said to us, maybe some of you need to be more like the drug dealer or whoever it is that you're sitting there criticizing because that drug dealer knows he needs to sell X amount of this mm -hmm. to make X amount of money and he needs to be on this corner and so forth. And he's very intentional about he, what he or she, very intentional about what they're doing. And that is what is wrong with, not wrong, but that's what most of us are not doing. We are not being intentional about our dreams. Right. Yes. So I absolutely love it that you are again reinforcing um, yes. reinforcing that for us. Thank you very much on that. And like I said, on Tuesday evening, uh, a group of 10 of us will be meeting with um, Elaine to mm -hmm. talk about, um, not talk about, she's going to take us through the process. We had another guest and um, she, she uh, uh, Anya, she talked about, and maybe you have something to, con to, to add to this. She talked about um, an, a practical step of doing that is she called it scripting. Hmm. Yes. What, yes. What's your, your, your understanding? What, how do you do scripting? Um, I've seen different methods of scripting. Uh, some people write it down. There's something called the three, six, nine method. Um, I don't know much about it, but I know people who just like, they just write down everything that they want at a certain amount of times. Or like for me, like you said, you have a vision board, but I write down things in my journal. And I just kind of like set the intention and I'm like, you know, I, so like, yeah, scripting is, um, yeah. and people don't realize that those of us that, you know, were raised with the Bible, there is a verse in the Bible that says, write the vision and make it plain. So, you know, there is a thing of <laughs> to scripting. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 I'm always blown away when of late, I listen to these one-time traditional pastors or preachers and they're saying the things that mm -hmm. that was hidden from most of us all mm -hmm. of these years you know things like scripting things like setting your intention things like being clear things like you know declaring a thing and 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 it will be you know and um it it is so true mm -hmm. that that most of us, we don't do it, you know, and instead we sit and complain about what the other person has or, or doesn't have. So before we wrap up here, let's talk about this. All of this leads into um, your work as a success strategist. Mm -hmm. um, tie that up for us. Put a bow on that for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I help women through that rebirth process, identifying and, you know, they want to live life as who they are. Then take those intentional steps to do X, Y, and Z. So I try to help you tee you up to, you know, take the chances. And so a lot of people are like, okay, how does the death duel apart work in this? I want you to die empty. Die Ooh. doing the things that you were created to do. Right? I love that. <laughs> die empty. Die empty because we are all born with a purpose. And like some people think that, oh, the purpose is winning 27 Grammys or some big grand purpose. No, 
The purpose could just be breaking some generational curses. The purpose could be you actually doing what it is you want to do because your grandmothers and great grandmothers couldn't, right? So it, it it's dying empty. It's leaving that legacy because the legacy that our purpose is not only for us, it's for people that are around us and the people that come after us. So the death doula is helping you leave that legacy. And yes, a part of the legacy is end of life planning. Set your family up for success. Don't have them looking for stuff after you die and you leaving them with all this craziness, setting them up for success, you doing legacy work. What do you want to do? And like your legacy is doing what you were created to do and just dying empty. So I help you put it all together so you can, you know, have a full life. <laughs> Starting from rebirth to yes. Yes. making your transition empty. Yes. I love that. I love that. Because what you're saying is they have this meme about living for to take a vacation, you know, or um, people waiting till they retire to live their life. What you're saying, mm -hmm. don't wait for that. No. Do everything. Do everything. Yeah. So when you're on your deathbed, have you, have you, I've had the experience, but have you actually been with someone as they're making their transition? Yes. So it's a um, beautiful moment. <laughs> it, I it think is. So. When it's, when it's, when it's not tragedy, you know, like a car accident or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It, it's a very beautiful moment. And, and I think a lot of people, they're scared of that moment to sit with them because they don't know what's going to happen. But there are times when I do sit vigil because death doulas, they do sit vigil with people who are about to transition. That means you're just sitting and you're just holding space for the person that's about to die. So there are times when I do sit with people that are about to transition and sometimes it's really beautiful and, you know, they are at peace. Um, sometimes, <laughs> um, but we're all sometimes going Sometimes they're not, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they're not. Sometimes I don't want to go. Yeah. Um, but then it's just like you just, you think about what they're thinking. Like, oh, I should have done this. I wish I did this. Or I sat with a woman, she was in her 90s, and she lived a full life, a full life. And you just, at that time, you just look back and you say, okay, I'm done. I did it. And they just go and it, it's, it's very beautiful it can be beautiful people might be wondering you know what 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 i'm talking about you know um i'm a trained chaplain mm -hmm. and um i i worked in a hospital for a while and and that is that is one of the things we had to do you know we had to one be in the morgue um well even before you got to the morgue you know we'd be called to be with someone when they're making their transition and i remember one night being called and um oh my god even thinking about it now uh, it, it 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 brings tears to my eyes because it was such a beautiful experience in that yes the family was grieving but we the lady had cancer and you know was on our bed and we were all holding hands. We circled the bed and held hands and somebody held our hands as she made her transition. And oh, what a precious gift, privilege for me, you know. So like you, um, there was a time that I feared death, but I don't anymore. And my daughter, who incidentally is watching, um, she 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 hates it when I say I'm ready to go. Mm. <laughs> I am, you know. So, <laughs> I am ready to go whenever you know. What I I I I I made a little extension, you know. I said to to the creator, you know, give me a little bit more time because I have two beautiful granddaughter. Mm -hmm. who, um, this is one of them. <laughs> oh, so sweet. <laughs> uh, I have two beautiful granddaughters, and this one in particular, she she has entered my life when I didn't think that I could, I had the capacity to love anybody again, you know, and she's entered my life, and every minute this little girl is kissing me and telling me how much she loves me and so forth. So I said to the creator, okay, give me a little bit more time to yeah. be with her, to get to, you know, and her mom fully on her feet and, and all of that, but I'm ready, I'm I'm ready whenever it's time to go. But maybe I still have a little emptying to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's read a comment here. Christine says, um, 
that was the worst moment of my life, watching my mother transiting and couldn't do anything about it. Christine, why do you think you needed to do anything about it? Um, I don't know if you want to call me. I, I, I had a number there. You can call me on WhatsApp. You know, this might be something that um, Erin can walk you through um, before we go. Let me put the number back up quickly. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, she said, um, when my parents went, I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. It's an experience I will never, ever forget. I speak yeah. to her, Erin. Death is definitely harder on the living. <laughs> it's definitely harder on the living. And um, you're just, you can't preempt preemptively grieve either. Like, so I know people who like, you know, your parents are going to pass and they try to like preemptively grieve. But it just, even when you are prepared, it's still like a punch in the gut. Um, so... It's just death hurts. Um, and I don't, I can't say anything to anyone that would make it um, better. It's, it's just one of those things that it just definitely hurts. And, um, but I hope that you had a really good relationship with them. And like, I know like the memories and the things and I know Sometimes you you wish that you could say more. You wish that you could do more, um, but it's definitely um, sit in that and, and and grieve. People don't grieve properly. Um, a lot of people would just push past the grief, um, but sometimes you need to sit in it. And sometimes you may need to talk to someone like a grief therapist, a grief counselor, or something that will help you um, come to you know peace about it. Yeah. Um, before we go, based on what you just said a while ago, um, what do you think? Do you think it it helps people to go to the graveside of their loved ones, or, or what? what you, I mean, different thing works for different people. You know, um, there was a time when I would get annoyed. I'm being honest <laughs> with people who every year they post their pictures of their loved ones, la, 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 you know, and until I lost my husband, until he was murdered. And I now do it every year. <laughs> you know, um, so the grieving is, is, is different for everybody. Eh? It's definitely different for everybody. And it might make you feel comforted to go to the grave, but some people, it kind of opens that wound again. Um, so some people can't see the grave side. They can't see that. And it just, whatever helps you. Um, it helps me to go. Um, however, when I was little, when my grandfather or grandmother died, there was my grandfather. I fell in the graveyard next to like an open grave. Mm. <laughs> and that kind of like it didn't traumatize me, but it, I kind of felt weird going to the graveyard like until I was like an adult, but now I'm fine. But I think it's just do whatever you feel you mm -hmm. need. If you don't want to go, don't go. I don't feel like you have to go. So Christine says she has two um, comments since. And then she lost her son after her parents. Mm -hmm. They went seven months apart. Each just imagine each imagine the hurt and the pain and she continues yes i had a very good relationship with them i have learned so much from them i wonder if you're still uh, missing them as much as you did then um, um christine or has it transformed in, into into something else into a kind of celebration of the life that they led Okay, so we're coming to the bewitching hour of wrap up. I, I just want to bring up your book again um, so that people who who are interested in, in, in getting a copy, it's available at Amazon. The name of the book is Destroy the Mask, A Woman's Guide to Unlock Her True Self, Live Out Her Purpose, and Leave a Legacy of Power. I'm going to be buying a lot of books this for, for this Christmas basket <laughs> this year for our members. Um, um, any, any final words you, you had to share with us? Um, this is 
this is a different conversation for me in that it's we learned what what is a rebirth to death doula. Mm -hmm. um, we also learned about the 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 unmasking, you know, and how what's 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 involved in the process of unmasking. And even I think that we are witnessing an unmasking right here live um, with Christine, um, with Christine sharing with us, you know, um, her parents passing and her child's passing. She might not realize it, but um, I I feel that um, she is uncovering something here. Um, this evening in, in, in her comments, you know, um, I don't know what you think, Erin. Um, yeah. And just being honest about just how you feel about them and the pain that you feel with their passing. I mean, that's, that's heavy and it's a, it's a lot um, of hurt and pain and, and things. And so I pray that you are getting the support that you need. If you're not, I hope that you're able to find somebody to help you with this journey because it's it's definitely a very heavy journey to lose your parents and your child. Yeah, they're your world. And it's just, that's a lot. And so, I, I mean, I have a friend who lost both of her parents at a really young age and it's just that hurt just doesn't seem to go away. So I pray that you are getting the support that that you need uh, and that you will get it if you don't if you're not receiving it right now. Um but you could set up that group um Erin or you could you could always jump in ours, you know, we do have a, <laughs> yeah. an active group on Facebook, you know, we always open to to having people come in and you know talk to talk to our members you know that help them work through this and Christine is is actually one of our group um, moderators so mm -hmm. um, we'll be happy to have you have a session with I'd us love to be a part I'd love to be a part of it I'm not a grief like specialist however I do there are resources that I can give because I know some death doulas that hold death cafes um, where people who have who are um, dealing with grief, they come together and they work through like a curriculum or they just have like an open forum of just support. So I can share some resources with you. Okay. I will be in touch with you to, yeah. to <laughs> listen, never offer Claudette, even if you don't mean, because I'm going to be in your inbox. <laughs> Any final words before we go? Um, if you feel like you're living out of alignment and according to somebody else's rules, somebody else's blueprint, I urge you to destroy the mask, live the life you are created to live and die empty, having done all the things that you wished or hoped to do. And as Colleen says, I love this conversation. I'm trying each day to do some mm -hmm. unmasking. Yes. And we wear so many masks. So um, this, this, this conversation is just the first step in um, in in that process of unmasking. So, Erin, thank you so much for being with us this evening. And thank believe you. me, I am going to be in touch um, <laughs> with you about having a session with our group. Um, so, Cleo, Cleo, Cleo K. Carl, <laughs> that's really learned a lot. Thanks for sharing with me. You are most welcome. Thank um, thank you, everyone, for being here with us this evening, especially to you, Erin. Um, you didn't have to say yes, but you did. And um, we really do appreciate it. And I will be in touch with you. Folks, remember, you can get Erin's book on Amazon. It's called Destroy the Mask, A Woman's Guide to Unlock Her True Self, Live Out Her Purpose, and Leave a legacy of power. Thanks everybody for being here and see you on Tuesday. Those, those of you who will be a part of our special session with Elaine Starlin about setting our intentions. And we'll be having a, such a session as well with Erin um, in the near future. Thanks and um, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Bye. Bye.